Okay, hi everyone. Uh, hopefully this works. Uh, this is my first time doing a pre-recorded lecture, um, but thanks for inviting me to present to your social work class. Uh, my name is Vincent Wong and I'm an assistant professor at Windsor Law School, uh, researching undocumented migrant labor in Canada and its structuring through immigration, education and labor institutions. So uh, today, this pre-recorded lecture is entitled uh, Canadian Immigration from Below. We have it. And the goal of this presentation is to unsettle some of the assumptions around the Canadian immigration system by examining it both systematically and critically uh, from the view of those who are marginalized and peripheralized by it. So you can get a big picture view of how bordering regimes, which include immigration law and policy, differentially include or exclude certain bodies in ways that fundamentally structure migrants' experiences in Canada. And so you might ask, okay, well, this sounds a little bit theoretical. Why is it important? Well, for uh, a class in social policy, especially in the practice of social work, you're likely going to see many, many people with various forms of status precarity. And it's estimated that those who are living in Canada but are unable to actually access citizenship or permanent residency is around 1.7 million people in Canada and uh, obviously concentrated heavily around large urban centers like Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, et cetera. And so 1.7 million people in this country face this precariousness in status, uh, be it they be migrant workers, uh, international students, refugees, uh, and other status excluded peoples. And one more preliminary comment is that there is an absolute massive litany of laws that regulate our society, right? So on the way to class, if you drove, uh, you know, chances are you probably exceeded the speed limit and broke the law. Uh, if you walk, chances are that you may have jaywalked and you've crossed a street, uh, not at a designated crosswalk. Uh, we all frequently engage in illegal actions, but breaking the immigration law is treated a little bit differently in the sense that you didn't just engage in lawful con conduct, you are actually constructed as illegal per se. And so the argument goes, because you are illegal, you are illegal, not the act that you did was against the law, uh, you may be stripped of your fundamental rights, uh, rights that protect other people. But human movement and mobility, of course, is not the exception in history. It is the rule. Indeed, people don't cross borders. Borders often cross people, as we will see. So I wanted to try to contextualize and situate some of the key stories that you might have you know, seen in the news. And one is on the left side, uh, this migrant workers letter to the Jamaican labor minister, uh, where Jamaican farm workers in the Niagara region wrote an open letter to Jamaica's minister of labor requesting support in what they called conditions of systemic slavery. Uh, this was days before a migrant worker actually died in Norfolk County. His name was Garvin Yap of St. James, Jamaica, in an accident with a tobacco harvester. Uh, and according to the Migrant Workers Alliance for Justice, three other workers actually had died in Ontario in that week alone. And these agricultural workers, primarily from the Caribbean, uh, from Mexico and the Philippines, described housing conditions as so poor that rats ate their food, they lived in crowded rooms with zero privacy, with actual cameras, they lacked dryers to dry their clothes, uh, and they were constantly reined in. And as workers in working conditions, uh, they said they were treated like mules and punished for not being quick enough, exposed to pesticides without adequate protection, and their bosses would physically intimidate them, destroy their personal property, and threaten to send them home if they were not in line. And in response, uh, Jamaica's Minister of Labor, Carl Samuda, actually said 
he would put together a special fact-finding team of six people to travel to Canada to observe uh, operations and speak with workers. Um, a second one is, you know, something that, uh, uh, you know, Aline has been very active on is anti-trafficking raids that turn into anti-migrant raids when targeting sex workers. And in April 2018, Butterfly uh, published 18 testimonies from migrant and Asian sex workers, 15 of them of whom had been actually deported uh, as a result of um, the consequences that came from anti-trafficking raids, when they didn't find uh, you know, what they thought amounted to trafficking, they would use the law that then turn on uh, people with precarious status uh, and actually detain them, uh, ship them over to CBSA for immigration detention and initiate deportation uh, proceedings. So um, these are just kind of like two stories that uh, you can delve into, just kind of see the experience of people who are uh, marginalized and indeed uh, experience the sharp end of the immigration law. But you might not be able to kind of see systematically how this is produced, right? And uh, since the 1990s, Canada's immigration policies have moved in a significantly uh, neoliberal direction. Although there are, of course, discontinu discontinuities and moments of resistance from this, uh, and we might be moving towards a moment of discontinuity today. But by neoliberalism, I refer to a set of ideologies which attempt to uh, purge the system of obstacles to free markets, restrain public expenditure and any form of collective initiative, uh, celebrate virtues of individualism, competitiveness, and economic self-sufficiency, and abolish or weaken social transfer programs uh, while fostering the inclusion of the poor and marginalized into the labor market on highly exploitative terms. So the big question is in this you know, general neoliberal area, then what is the role of Canadian immigration policy? And if we understand that, we can really understand why on a large level, uh, this sort of exploitation, uh, is produced by the immigration system. And uh, social workers will see a lot of, of, of that on a, you know, kind of an individual basis when you start your work. And I would say that the overarching thrust of the role of immigration policy in neoliberal era can be encapsulated by the idea of freedom for capital and unfreedom for labor. And as you will see, in order to create such a system, the state and state mechanisms such as immigration law and policy actually play an enormous role. So uh, in terms of immigration, there are five elements that I would like to highlight in terms of neoliberal immigration in Canada, but also elsewhere, uh, especially among other developed countries. So one is uh, the idea of permanently temporary. Number two is the idea of nation state as a profit maximizing corporation or firm. Number three is the idea of worthiness dictated primarily by wealth or proxies of, for wealth. And number four, crimigration. And number five, uh, nationalism as taking on a key role in socially organizing difference and hierarchy. And in thinking through these you know, five elements, I again want us to keep in mind the huge role of the state, uh, of the government in creating the conditions that allow for freedom for capital and unfreedom for labor. How unfree labor, unfree migrant labor, relies on the state's use of what we call uh, extra economic compulsion to exact labor power. That is the use of political and legal compulsion rooted in restricting citizenship status and migration status. So let's go through uh, uh, all of these in a little more detail. So to understand this first idea of permanently temporary, uh, I thought I'd show you this status pyramid to graphically demonstrate the state's creation of hierarchical categories for rights and protections. Okay, so you have 
citizens that have the full set of rights at the very top. Then you have permanent residents who almost have uh, these full rights to, to live and work and to social entitlements, but that there are conditional on non-criminality and residency. Uh, and the third one is this uh, very limited and precarious sort of rights condition called temporary status. So people might have uh, work permits, temporary work permits, or they might be an international student permits, uh, refugee um, uh, claimant uh, papers. So you have this kind of very uh, nebulous area where you are excluded from some of these rights and at any time, uh, essentially, the government could kind of take away that status and uh, expose you to the risk of deportation. And then at the very bottom, you have status excluded residents or undocumented residents who have almost no rights, uh, no access or very, very limited access to social, educational um, and economic institutions and uh, are always kind of in fear of uh, law enforcement and being deported. And it's very important to note historically that, you know, kind of these two uh, bottom sections of the pyramid were very uncommon. That temporary residency itself was very uncommon until the 19, uh, until 1973. And it was really created as a response to uh, racism being eliminated, explicit racism being eliminated from immigration and the opening up uh, of Canada to non-white countries in 1967, right? Prior to that, we essentially had uh, what we would call now a status for all. That is permanent residency was granted immediately upon arrival. And so there was this real big window of opportunity uh, between 1967 and 1973, where many global South uh, immigrants were able to immediately get uh, status on, on arrival, regardless of um, their class situation or their gender or their race. Uh, and that uh, uh, was changed in 1973 when the Canadian government began introducing temporary work visas. Uh, the first kind of temporary foreign worker program was created that would uh, replace status for all with a temporary and contingent work visa. And now these work visas created a situation where you had a two-tiered system where you had certain migrant workers primarily workers from the global south, primarily in low wage work, who could not seek employment outside of the work contract, could not apply for permanent resident status, and had limited access to social health and economic benefits. And so this, in addition to being denied any voting rights, has produced this current system, a situation of permanent disenfranchisement that leaves them uniquely vulnerable to uh, labor, exploitation, uh, and abuse. But because the situation accords so well with capitalist accumulation and status quo uh, racial relations, temporary labor migration has now replaced permanent immigration as the primary means by which uh, people enter Canada. And hence the, the idea of permanently temporary. As you can see, uh, this is up till uh, from 71 to 2017. Uh, the number of people on temporary status has absolutely skyrocketed. Um, and part of this is an enormous expansion of international students, in part to keep the Canadian education system afloat with exorbitant and discriminatory tuition fees during a prolonged period of, of austerity, right? And to provide uh, a disposable and exploitable status excluded labor force. So uh, the second one is, uh, you know, through this increasingly dominated idea of maximizing economic benefits for the host country, uh, neoliberal, has, uh, neoliberal immigration has moved away from a holistic view of what a healthy society ought to be as a whole uh, to directing and managing a profit maximizing corporation, right? And you can see a lot of this in the way that Canadian immigration actually talks about itself. So the IRCC, Immigration Refugee uh, Citizenship Canada, has a campaign called Immigration Matters. And you can sort of see the logic 
of the elements uh, of what that is, is it, it actually means in terms of profit maximizing for Canada. So the idea that immigrants contribute to the economy, create jobs for Canadians, support our aging population, meet our labor market needs, filling temporary labor needs, uh, sustaining Canadian education through international students and boosting trade. Uh, but the impact of what this actually means in practice is using the state and immigration policy to cheapen labor in order to maximize capital accumulation, right? Uh, when we talk about Canadian education system and sustaining it, it has, mean, has meant blatant wealth appropriation. So a massive increase in uh, administrative user fees and in terms of tuition. So for example, I looked it up just at McMaster in the social work program. If you are a domestic full-time student, uh, tuition is $6,000 approximately. If you are an international student, uh, it is uh, $40,960 a year, right? So uh, I, you can do the math on that, but that hasn't always been uh, the case. And so uh, that has been an enormous, uh, just sort of taking out wealth transfer uh, has been an increasingly dominant idea in immigration policy. Uh, also, the idea of downloading immigration decisions directly to, to businesses, right? So business now uh, does an enormous amount of the actual immigration screening. And so capital kind of controls uh, who gets PR and who doesn't, who gets temporary work permits and who doesn't, and on uh, what conditions. And uh, another uh, element of this idea of the immigration law as profit maximizing is using temporary work permits as mechanisms for labor control. So we talked a little about that tying labor to a particular employer, using the threat of deportation, uh, and excluding uh, migrant workers from collective bargaining, from labor protections, from health and social services. There's also an enormous gendered element to this, right? Uh, caregiver programs are essentially used to underwrite social reproduction of work in global North families by hiring global South women and therefore externalizing the costs of family separation uh, to global South families. So in terms of permanent residency, uh, that is privileged largely for people who have capital, for investors, professionals, managers, those are uh, groups are given opportunities for avenues to permanent residency, whereas low wage workers, uh, blue collar workers are uh, given this impose this condition of uh, permanent temporality. So the third thing intimately connected to this idea is the idea of running immigration uh, in using access to status and tying it into indices of wealth. So this is often couched in terms of uh, individuals' worthiness or deservingness of status, right? To individualize it and then talk about individual merit. Um, so you can see in this sort of merit-based system where family immigration is apparently you know, not meritous, or refugee protection is essentially not meritorious, what you get is a enormous increase uh, since the 1980s of economic immigration uh, subserving and, and overtaking um, family immigration and refugee immigration, right? Uh, so this has uh, been pushed back a little bit, right? So this is only till 2009. Uh, the liberal government has has sort of adjusted this a little bit closer than what it was before. Uh, but the economic portions of it, uh, economic immigration is an increasing share of permanent residency. And that ties into the theme of running immigration and running a nation state like a firm. And even family immigration has uh, had this idea of merit and wealth uh, built in now 
to the family sponsorship program. So for instance, uh, pa uh, parent and grandparent sponsorship, which previously uh, was, uh, you had as a matter of right, the ability to sponsor your parents or grandparents if you were a Canadian citizen or PR, um, that has been uh, qualified by what is called a minimum necessary income requirement. So you have to be making uh, a certain amount of income, have to have a certain amount of wealth in order to even have the chance, uh, the opportunity to uh, reunify with your family, with your uh, parents and grandparents. And so this increasing proportion of the economic immigration, who is this actually given to, right? And it's very, very important to know that for the most part, this is not given to, uh, uh, you know, people who are migrant workers uh, from a low wage or uh, sort of a manual labor uh, sort of industry, but rather given to uh, people who are more privileged by capital, right? So uh, high skilled workers, um, business workers, uh, there used to be a straight up investor sort of program. Uh, there are small little uh, uh, pilots that are given to, for example, caregivers because of caregiver organizing, but for the most part, um, economic migration is given to those who are privileged by uh, the neoliberal kind of capitalist regime. So uh, the fourth element to, to talk about then is the idea of crimmigration, okay? So crimmigration is the growing convergence between criminal and immigration regimes and the convergence between criminal and immigration law. And now it's, it's sort of so um, common sense that people forget that this is actually a very a particularly new uh, sort of idea that has really only kind of taken shape post 9-11. And previously, migration was treated primarily as an immigration uh, administrative matter, right? It was kept completely separate from uh, criminal sanction. With the creation of uh, the Canadian Border Services Agency, the CBSA in 2003, uh, with ARPA, the Immigration Refugee Protection Act that was passed uh, in 2001, which has a section that directly uh, criminalizes uh, uh, or, or, or links the criminal regime to immigration. Because if you are somebody who doesn't have full citizenship, even if you are a permanent resident, now you can have uh, your status stripped from you if you have run-ins with the law. So what this is essentially mean is that uh, the people, the types of people, the types of groups that are over-criminalized uh, are also doubly punished by immigration consequences. So you could have a situation where you are doing time uh, because of criminal sanction and then directly move from, uh, from criminal jail into immigration detention and then immigration will then punish you uh, by stripping away your status and starting deportation against you. Uh, many people, many migrants have been told to accept plea deals, including Canadian permanent residents, uh, in which they, you know, maybe it's a plea to uh, marijuana charges and they get detained, uh, they, they accept the plea deal, and then they have no idea, but they're actually stripped of their status. Some of these people have been sent, uh, have, have been living in Canada for decades. Um, I've had a, you know, a couple of cases like this. And then they are sent back to, uh, to a place in which they essentially have no ties to anymore. And that is one of the consequences of this crimmigration system. Um, this has disproportionately affected migrant sex worker communities. Uh, it has affected people with mental health issues, uh, people who live in poverty, essentially anybody who has been uh, disproportionately policed and criminalized by our criminal justice system. And furthermore, if you are detained by the immigration detention system, especially in this era of crimmigration, 
uh, you can be detained indefinitely with no obligation for for release, even if you've never, um, you know, even if you have an opportunity uh, for parole, um, that can be rejected. You don't have sort of the due process uh, rights that you normally would have in the criminal justice system. So this uh, Canada has been criticized for in International Human Rights Forum. Uh, the UN has explicitly stated that this is a violation of international human rights law, but it continues on and it be continues on in part because of this idea of uh, migration as something that needs to be criminalized as the uh, under the view that Canada is under attack from criminal or dangerous or undeserving uh, outsiders. And the final thing that I'd like to uh, highlight is how nationalism is now doing the heavily, heavy lifting of socially organizing difference and hierarchy, right? Uh, obviously, we live in an era where you can no longer explicitly uh, use race to sort and subordinate people through the law. Um, but these discourses of un racial undesirability now stand in for racial discourses of inferiority, right? So that, you know, certain people are undesirable. They just happen to be uh, people from the global south or people who are racialized others or people who are considered culturally uh, distant from uh, uh, kind of a Eurocentric norm. It is uh, then used within the idea of nation state building uh, to, to legalize and justify discrimination. So nationalism in this way both organizes and helps to mask racialized forms of difference that organize inequalities, right? It is why not all strangers are equally strange. It is, is why, you know, if you have uh, people who are traveling here uh, on temporary status from Europe, they're not, uh, or from the United States, they're not um, subject to the same sort of law enforcement, to the surveillance and targeting of bordering regimes uh, as people from the global south, right? And because uh, immigration does so much, bordering regimes do so much to legitimize and make apolitical, um, legalized subordination and discrimination, it's obvious that this, this rights vacuum will then be simply expanded, right? And its naturalization of differences will be used for the purposes of justifying inequalities, in, including in the, in the labor market, right? The key is to make subordination and oppression apolitical. So it's not, it's, it's uh, uh, seen as a matter of national obligation to exclude undesirable migrants. Uh, rather than something that is morally questionable. And the final uh, thing that I would kind of leave you with uh, in terms of thinking about neoliberal immigration is the idea that borders do not affect everybody similarly. Uh, and I'll share uh, this quote where the third world grates against the first and bleeds. Um, that is very frequently the experience of borders by people who are uh, uh, migrants from the global south. Yeah, and uh, I'll also share this quote from Nandita Sharma, who is a great uh, scholar in this space. For a small select group of people, borders are mere formalities. Uh, business people, government officials, state armed forces, tourists, and personnel of legitimated international government organizations traverse them practically at will and with very little thought. And on the other hand, borders never leave others alone, in, particularly, uh, in particular for people who are assigned as a migrant worker or illegal status in the countries in which they live, work, and sometimes die. Borders follow them to school, to work, Indeed, they encounter borders in every aspect of their lives. 
And this is why it's really, really important to see the Canadian immigration system from below, as opposed to uh, just from the people who have power and the, the people who create it, right? And so, of course, uh, there is a enormous amount of organizing and resistance to uh, the ideas and the processes and effects of neoliberal migration. Uh, just, you know, uh, last Saturday, there was an enormous status for all rally uh, all across. There were rallies all across the country. I believe this one is in Christie uh, Pitts Park. And people are coming up to this realization, this political consciousness in various different ways. But, uh, you know, migrant organizing has started to push back away from this proliferation of the, the permanently temporary of uh, naturalized exploitation and uh, pushing for status for all. And that's really what we're seeing in a lot of different uh, places in Canada. Uh, groups coming together to organize for commonality, for uh, equality, and for dignity for migrants. And so much so that the liberal government for the first time has actually stated in their mandate letter for immigration that uh, some sort of regularization program, status regularization program, is in the works. Uh, and that is only on the table because of the organizing and because of the political education and consciousness building that has uh, been done in migrant uh, worker circles and for, for allies for many, many years. So uh, that's my presentation. Um, I hope you got something from it. And I'm looking forward to chatting with the class uh, next Wednesday. So uh, take care and have a, have a wonderful week. Bye.